everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Jedi Way here on the Outlaw Nation channel. I am the outlaw, John Brokaro, known as Roca Fett around these parts, and very excited to be diving back into the world of Star Wars with these two wonderful people. First, uh, my co-host here on the show since the beginning, Laura Kelly. She's the co-host of Force Toast Pod, and she's back from a fresh time in Denver how are you, Kelly? Uh, how are you, Laura, Kelly? How are things going on in your world? <laughs> I'm good. I literally just got an email today of somebody calling me Kelly. It happens oh. a lot because my email is, of course, L. Kelly, and I should just be used to it. But I don't know. It's just funny. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, like so happy funny. to have it happen. IRL here. But yeah, I'm very happy to be back in Chicago. Denver was a lot of fun. But, you know, like you're away from your own bed for like two weeks and you're just like, oh. I just want to be back in my own bed. And it's a great time to be back in Chicago because it's beautiful out so i'm very happy to be home and not trying to do the jedi way from like the place that was house sitting without all of my setup like i'm back with all my camera and my microphone and it's all good that being said you did a wonderful job there from colorado so i mean i i know we have confidence if we ever need if you ever need to do it from that place again it'll sound good and speaking of sounding good uh, joining us uh, in place of kevin smith who unfortunately cannot make it because of work commitments uh, thankfully, one third of the Geek Buddies and a massive Star Wars fan uh, and one of you all's favorites people in the world here is joining us, uh, MK2 himself, Michael Vogel. How are you, Michael? Good. I just re I just realized that MK2 kind of sounds like a droid name. Totally. It does. Like R two D two C three P O M K Tune. Like I think like that could be like my droid designation. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to be here. I think is this my first Jedi way? No. You did one. I was gonna say, ago. yeah. You I did, did one, one months ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say. I just honestly, I was just saying before we started. Uh, I'm I so miss talking Star Wars with Laura. I talk Star Wars with Johnny all the time, but I'm thrilled True. to be here. So thank you for having me on. It's exhausting to talk with me all the time about Star Wars. The, Laura is a much fresher face and a much more vibrant person. Truly, you thank have a dizzying you. intellect. <laughs> But listen, we got to talk before we start. Listen, first of all, thank you to everybody who endured our last episode because we know it was a bit of a downer. We don't like to have downer episodes here on the Jedi Way, but we had to confront what happened with the Acolyte, the cancellation and the repercussions and what have you. So we covered all of that. This is going to be a much more positive episode, shall we say? Oh, we're probably going to have occasional comments on what have you, but we're focusing on the fact that it is the 10 year anniversary of of uh kathleen kennedy becoming or or, or disney uh, taking charge of lucasfilm and kathleen kennedy uh putting in charge the new canon for star wars so we're going to talk about all the things that we liked from the new canon we like from the new canon here in this episode but before we dive into that though i gotta talk to mk toon about uh his journey through the video game star wars outlaws mine is still in plastic i've yet to open this thing i've been been so busy the last few days but you've been playing it non-stop michael what are your feelings reviews reactions to playing star wars outlaws well my first feeling is uh anger at myself um mainly because uh, i don't know if you all know this but i uh a week a little over a week ago fractured my thumb at the oh. gym um and what? yet and yet, uh, still played video games all weekend and don't think that that was great for my thumb. <laughs> so I'm a little mad at myself. I was icing my thumb today after uh, after finishing a mission for Crimson Dawn in Star Wars Outlaws. But uh, I am thoroughly enjoying Star Wars Outlaws. I am having such a blast. Uh, the open world setting in a galaxy far, far away is a very different vibe. I love... I love Cal Kestis. I mm -hmm. love Jedi Fallen Order. I love Jedi Survivor. But there is something about just tooling around planets, doing missions for random Nemoidians. Uh, like, it's just a good time. And one of the things that's most fun about Star Wars Outlaws, actually, is uh, that because it's open world and you can make your own choices, depending on what you do and which jobs you take between... Uh, the Hut Syndicate, the Pike Syndicate, and uh, and Crimson Dawn, um, you go up or down in the rankings. You have good reputations with them. You have bad reputations. I currently have a poor reputation with the Huts, an excellent <laughs> reputation with Crimson Dawn, and a terrible reputation with the Pikes because fuck the Pikes. I hate them. So wow. at any opportunity, um, 
in the game that I have to double cross the pikes I do. Also, I have become quite adept at the Kessel version of Sabak. So I have uh, been winning a lot of money at the Sabak tables. Um, but yeah, it's it's just fun. Like it is, it is, there's something about just living in yeah. the Star Wars universe and getting to just make decisions and make choices that is really, really thrilling. So I am having an absolute blast. And to all the people that are going on and on about how ugly K Vess is, get the fuck out of here. Y'all are crazy. I, mean, yeah. I think she is what? I think she is lovely. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen that, Laura, but yeah, that's that's the new attack that she's too ugly to lead a game. There's been also been commentary about the fact that it's voiced by a Latina. Uh it's all kinds of nonsense yet again involved in a game, but yeah, most of the reviews, Mike, are, are very much along your um, your feelings on it. The people are very excited about; it. they're enjoying playing it. So, uh, I'm looking forward to popping mine open. Laura, do you indulge in the video games at all? Do you occasionally play? Is this something you would maybe consider because it's open world? You discover a little bit more of this uh, this place and or this time and where it's set uh, here in the Star Wars universe. You know, in theory, it's so appealing, but I just I I can't like I've I remember trying to play Battlefront with Alice at one point um oh, and yeah. it went so terribly I mean like I I just I never graduated beyond an N64 and so the idea of there being like two joysticks or whatever is like my my brain can't possibly handle it so really I was Fair. just thinking the other day nice. that it would be fun to get a Nintendo Switch but I only want to play the Mario games I have no interest in playing like anything Star Wars related even so yeah sadly not a gamer I had missed all of that like flack in the news about people yeah. reacting poorly uh to the lead character in this in Outlaws that's really that's so annoying to hear it's not surprising but it is annoying to hear for sure um I, i'm actually excited to talk about the things that we like about yes. the disney era of lucasfilm yeah. but i will say the thing that i dislike the most is uh what has become of a certain uh subset of the fandom so i think that yeah. this falls under that category i think that there is actually a lot to celebrate about the past decade of mm -hmm. star wars despite the fact that there's a lot that i don't like and i think the fact that there are some people that just seem dead set on hating everything um i feel bad for them i'm sad for them <laughs> yeah we, as we said we're going to keep it uh, positive and talk about the things that we have enjoyed over the last 10 years since uh the can announcement was made which was on april 25th of 2014 this was in preparation for the upcoming feature films lucasfilm announced that the expanded universe was rebranded as a legends and the term canon came to be reserved exclusively for the george lucas canon stuff the six movies in the seasons of star wars clone wars he developed and produced and then everything that stemmed from that date forward is this was essentially going to be canon so there's a lot to talk about and get into here throughout uh, this conversation for sure both uh, uh tv wise film wise uh book wise comic book wise video game wise so much has happened under the canon banner here with Lucasfilm over these last 10 years. So we're just going to talk about it. I know some of you may be super upset. Maybe you're calling us shills. Maybe you're upset. But you know, it's our show. And we want to talk about what we want to talk about. And that's what we're going to focus on. So Laura, let's go to you first. What is uh, What are some of the things that you, or maybe one particular project or a, few, a couple projects that you want to make sure we highlight first off the bat here under the 10-year canon that we've had so far? And what's your feelings on the uh, 10 years we've had uh, since we became since this canon edict was put down here by Lucasfilm in 2014. Well, you know, this last 10 years this has been like life changing for me because this mm. is when I became a Star Wars fan. Like I hadn't really I'd seen the Phantom Menace, but I hadn't sat and watched all of the films before this 10 year period. So the thing that really got me and like kind of captured me was that that Force Awakens trailer one of those those early ones and I couldn't tell you right mm. now if it's the teaser or the trailer um but I wouldn't be here I wouldn't have a podcast I wouldn't have made all the friends that I made um in the Star Wars community and in the Schmodown community mm. that trailer premiered though and captivated audiences around the world and me too it just like sucked me in it was one of those moments where I just felt like it was in a room full of people and it felt like everyone just disappeared and it was just like me and the tv and so the force awakens will always have like such a warm place in my heart and i i wanted to shout that out for sure mm -hmm. i mean that in the last jedi i think is in that it sort of falls into that for me too that that show real or that movie really tried to do something different with star wars and i know it didn't work for everyone but it really worked for me and mm -hmm. i really admired 
that they were kind of willing to like go out on a ledge a little bit and do something a little bit different and push the story forward and let Star Wars evolve in that way. So those are two that stand out for me. I have to mention Star Wars Rebels because that one is obviously huge. And it's so wild to see people to this day continuing to discover Star Wars Rebels and starting to watch it for the first time. I mean, that show came out in 2014. It's been 10 years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are still people that, you know, love it and talk about it on Twitter. And the fact that it's still getting discovered by new, new audiences all the time um, is is just really reinvigorating my love of that show. So I feel like I'm past due for a little bit of a rewatch. Um, that show I absolutely loved. But yeah, I mean, like the Ahsoka series, I absolutely loved. There are so many novels I could go on and on about, but like Lost Stars, the Thrawn novel that came out in 2017, Light of the Jedi, the entire High Republic. And then I did want to shout out the Clone Wars season seven too, because oh, yeah. do you remember when that trailer yeah. premiered at Comic-Con? And those words were on the screen, like a story left unfinished. That moment is like burned into my brain. Like I wasn't even there. I just remember like watching the trailer that when it came out that day and it's like a Star Wars core memory for me. So those are some of the things that I think Disney has done really, really well. A lot of those things are sort of earlier in that in that 10 year time period. But I don't think that they're, you know, that doesn't mean that I think the most recent five years have been bad. I do think that they were really knocking at it out of the park in that first five years. And then maybe like most recent five years has been a lot more of the hit or miss. Mm. Um, But Star Wars Visions is in there too. I think that's still massively underrated in terms of Star Wars storytelling. Um, But Michael, I would like to hear what you're, what's standing out for you in the last 10 years. Like what are your highlights that you, you got to throw out and mention there? Well, first I just, I think it's just, interesting to sort of lay the stage to say that you and I are like at the opposite ends of the fandom. So you are someone who kind of came to the fandom post the Disney acquisition through the force awakens. I born, born and raised a star Wars kid. Like I grew up on the original trilogy and not only did I grow up on the original trilogy, but I grew up on the extended universe. I remember going to the Walden books at the Oak Mall in Gainesville, Florida, <laughs> and buying the hardback cover of Heir to the Empire. And it was like the coolest thing in the world because the whole concept of getting a new Star Wars story was like, oh my God, I didn't think that was ever gonna happen. And we've got this book and it's Han and it's Luke and it's Leia and there's this new adventure. So I spent like middle school and high school uh, reading Star Wars comic books and reading all of these Star Wars novels where like crazy shit happened. Like Leia's riding a Rancor and using the force to like get a disease out of Mon Mothma's bloodstream. Like, I mean, I read like all the Jason, Janya, uh, Anakin, like Han and Leia's kids, like all of the stuff. So, and then in college, you know, Johnny and I went together to go mm. see uh, Phantom Menace when it yep. came out. and. John came out and said it was a bad movie. And I tried to convince myself for, for three more times that it was good. And then finally it was like, no, I don't, not everything I wanted it to be. Um, so like, I, I, I don't know why I remember this, but I was actually at Disneyland when the announcement happened that all of Ooh. the, I mean, not, not the announcement that Disney had bought Lucasfilm that had mm. already happened. But when the, the day that they announced that all of the, uh, everything that wasn't the movies and Clone Wars was going to be extended universe and didn't count anymore. Yeah. And I remember people just having feelings about it. And I think like even then, maybe it was because I was an executive at the time, but I was like, yeah, I get it. Like, I don't know how you expect Disney to make movies weaving through the 40 books and 80,000 comics that have come out. Like it, like it made sense oh. to me. Um, and then we dove into this new era. I think... Much like my experience with Phantom Menace, uh, Force Awakens, that trailer, I was so stoked. I was so excited. And I think because the prequels are not my favorite movies, um, I loved seeing The Force Awakens when it came out. I think it felt like Star Wars, seeing Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher. Like there was something about it that really just felt Star Wars to me. And I was like excited to be back in that universe again. As with The Phantom Menace, upon repeat viewings, I think The Force Awakens suffers particularly because of Rise of Skywalker. I think Rise of Skywalker ultimately puts a little bit of a a downbeat on this new trilogy because it doesn't end in a way that feels ultimately satisfying. But that being said, 
there's still a lot of stuff. I just did a rewatch of the new trilogy and there's a hmm. lot of stuff in those movies that is great. And when you are playing something like Star Wars Outlaws that opens up on Canto Bite, you do realize that we are gonna do with the, with the new trilogy, the same thing that we've done with the prequels and everything else, which is we are gonna cherry pick the planets and the aliens and the moments that we like, and we are going to blow those out in video games. We're gonna blow those out in comic books. We're gonna blow those out in novels, and we're gonna continue to tell those things. Um, I love The Mandalorian. I think Grogu, is single-handedly one of the smartest things, both from a story perspective and from a marketing and consumer products perspective that Disney and Lucasfilm have done. Um, beyond that, I think Andor deserves like special praise for raising the bar of Star Wars, Star Wars TV. Uh, much like Laura, I am a huge Star Wars animation fan. So I'll, I, while I think Visions is a great, uh, how do I want to say visions is like a great detour in star Wars. It's a right. great little thing, but clone wars and rebels. Uh, I think a thing that people forget cause we're so used to it now with Marvel and some other things, but the fact that when rogue one came out, uh, they mentioned general Syndulla and the ghost was the, a ship that you could see in a moment. And like the fact that they said, Hey, this animated thing is real. I mean, this is before Ahsoka showed up in live action and anything else. Like the fact that Lucasfilm and Disney took animated TV shows and said, Hey, this is all Canon. Like this is yeah. part of the homework that you have to do. They were one of the first to do that with a giant IP. Hmm. Um, and now we have James Gunn doing it with creature commandos and we have all the, you know, we have Marvel's what if, but Lucasfilm and Disney did that first. And I think that's a huge step forward in the way that we treat our IP and particularly the way we treat animation. Um, and then, I mean, I could talk about everything individually, but I will say that oddly, I think the biggest win that did that Star Wars has had in the Disney era, and it pretty much goes unsung, um, an acolyte arguably didn't do too much to help it, but I think the High Republic is one of the best things that Star Wars has done. Oddly, mm -hmm. um, I think that right now their biggest problem seems to be not knowing how to go forward and tell a brand new story in live action in the movies and the TV show, like what happens next? What, who, who is Ray going to fight? What is the empire? What is star Wars without an empire? But high Republic has turned into this amazing roadmap of here is a war, part of the star Wars universe, an era that has no Skywalkers, no R2D2, no C3PO, no empire, no stormtroopers, no Mandalorians, no, any of those things. It has the Jedi council. It has Yoda. It has the Republic. And it has brand new villains that have nothing to do with stormtroopers or Palpatine or Plagueis or anybody. Mm -hmm. And it works and it feels like Star Wars. So I think the High Republic long term is maybe going to do more for Star Wars and Disney than anyone is expecting it to right now. That's a great point, Mike, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's if we're throwing our Star Wars fandom on the table, you know, I, I a little bit older than Michael, a lot older than Laura. I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up when they were coming out in the theaters and that's what... I grew up with, right? I didn't go see A New Hope first. Uh, Empire Strikes Back is what I saw first. I saw New Hope uh, downstairs in the living room on a CBS movie of the week on a Sunday night. First time I ever saw A New Hope with my Chewbacca bathrobe on. So I remember... <laughs> <laughs> I remember distinctly <laughs> my little Chewbacca bathrobe on screaming at the television when Kenobi died. I remember that was an emotional moment for me. And so my dad took taking me to see Empire Strikes Back. So seeing these in the theater as a little bit as a teenager or a burgeoning teenager, young adult was an interesting experience and in getting to be part of the fandom and enjoying those films and then seeing how it's grown. And I dropped off for a while, right? It was actually the new canon that brought me back. It is, it was Kathleen buying it. It was, uh, oh, sorry, uh, um, uh, 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 Disney buying it and Kathleen being put in charge. This is where I got back connected. It also coincidentally is around the same time when I got into this business. So there's a really interesting kind of kismet in that because the first episode of Far, Far Away that I ever listened to uh, was the one when I, before I ever hosted the show, was with Tiffany and uh, Allison Hayslip talking about the canon being announced. That's back in May 1st of 2014, uh, that podcast episode, listening to them talk about the new canon. I remember being in Costco walking around there on the Los Feliz Costco and looking around all the stuff and here and just listening to them talk about the new canon and what's going on with the new canon, what this is all going to be. And Michael's right. There were a lot of feelings. I was just starting to, you know, kind of dabble a little bit, put my toe in the reactor 
universe thing through Christian. And so hearing people talk about it, I remember this was a massive deal. And Michael's right. Like we saw those, uh, we saw Phantom Menace together. We saw the other two movies together in LA as well, I believe. So we did. We, yeah. So it was like, this has always been a conversation, but it wasn't until these last 10 years that I really, um, so it became a, a huge part of my life and following all this stuff. And so for me to see it grow in so many interesting and fascinating ways, bringing me back to animation, bringing me back to reading the books, the comic books, covering the comic books all the time, initially in this first few years of the canon, as a canon verse, I guess I would say, uh, and then diving into the movies and following what's going on and then hearing about all the projects that were happening and not happening. And then Andor. I mean, Andor is really the big thing. For me, Force Awakens was... I, I love that movie, top to bottom. I'll watch it left and uh, uh, you know, um, day and night, and I will defend Daisy Ridley until my last breath. But then Andor came along, and Andor was the thing that spoke to me on so many levels for a number of reasons, and I so rejoiced in that show because uh, you know I had enjoyed everyone else's story. Here's a story that I understand that I appeal that, that appealed to me not only from a Star Wars level but a cultural level as well, and also from a political level. So there was so much that that show captured for me, and I think that's another great thing about the last ten years. Honestly, yes, there have been growing pains, and certainly there's been a lot of anger and what have you on certain sections of the fandom. But there has been an effort to make Star Wars for everybody, to try to have more voices in the room, to try to have more perspectives, more points of views, different ca characters from different walks of life, different economic strata, different ethnicities, different looks. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that's been really fascinating about the canon. And yeah, they haven't always gotten it right. And maybe some, some people may be right that they forced some occasional ones in there. Fine. But I think the effort was there to try to make Star Wars and expand it out to be a bit more inclusive of everyone. And that follows the edict of what George Lucas laid out from the beginning about Star Wars. So to me, I think that's what's been great about seeing the last 10 years and seeing what's happened with the canon and, and still factoring in all the flaws so nobody goes crazy and thinks we're just shilling here. There's certainly been flaws for sure, but I think there's also been a lot of great things to enjoy. Certainly that season of Clone Wars you're talking about, Laura, was fantastic. Star Wars Rebels. I mean, I was... Just kind of cursorily, curse. I was curse. I was a cursory watcher of that show because I was like, oh, it's kind of a kid show, kind of a kid show. Then that one episode with the radio tower and everything changed me completely, and I became a massive fan of that show and watched it religiously and loved it to pieces. And so there was so. And then you get into the books and all the stuff that was going on in the books, bloodlines and what have you. All of that was fascinating. You guys mentioned visions. It's not canon, but it's still. You can talk about it within the 10 year road for sure. But what of an off ramp, but an off ramp that was very fun to see and push the boundaries of what Star Wars could do. So to me, the last 10 years, even with all the missteps and the, the, uh, the, the, the pitfalls and what have you, I think it has to be commended for the effort that was being made to expand all the different ways that Star Wars can connect to people and reach out to people and all the different mediums that it took advantage of to get Star Wars out there. Uh, to as big of an audience as possible. Michael? It, you, it, you brought up Bloodlines, and I do think it, it is worth mm. pointing out that Star Wars, both pre-Disney and post-Disney, I think part of the tapestry of Star Wars that makes Star Wars Star Wars is fixing mistakes. Mm. Um, Certainly the Clone Wars did that. I, with... Well, starting in, yeah. I mean, I'll start with Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Look, I love Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi is part of the original trilogy. It's part of classic Star Wars. Sure. Boba Fett was the most popular character that ever came out of Empire Strikes Back, and he died like a fucking chump. Yeah. Like, he died with, like, a, like a Wilhelm scream and a, yep, he's, and a Sarlacc burp. Like, yep. for, for a character that was, like, a fucking <laughs> badass, George Lucas was like, you know what would be funny? I think he's just going to go down the thing, and he's going to go, up, and it'll be great. Let's do that. And like, that's what happened. And fans were like, the fuck is that? Like, what, what the fuck did you actually do? Then George Lucas makes Phantom Menace and goes, I'm going to slice the coolest bad guy ever in half so that, you know, he's really dead. Yeah. Yes, he wasn't. But, um, so I think that even in the George Lucas era, there are, there were decisions made that fans at the time, I mean, look, I happened to be at the exact right age that I thought the Ewoks were single-handedly sure. the greatest thing that had ever happened in movies. 
But if you were a little bit older than me and you were a Star Wars fan, you <laughs> went. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Like all these people now that are saying, oh, fucking Disney Star Wars, they're just making it for kids. Like people have been saying that since 1983. Yes. So I think, so I think what's interesting is you can look at it and I, you, you know, you made me think of this when you brought up Bloodlines. Rewatching The Force Awakens, it is criminal mm. that the politics of the galaxy make zero sense. Like yeah. there's the new Republic who seemingly said, Hey empire, you're cool, but don't fuck, don't fuck with us. And then when the empire started fucking with people, they said, Oh, I don't think they're fucking with us. And then Leia decided to start the resistance, but the opening crawl says she has the support of the Republic, but she doesn't clearly doesn't have the, like none of it makes sense. And then you read bloodlines and you go, oh, okay, that's actually really interesting politics. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, this yeah. is actually really cool. So I think that, and then, you know, and then we did Boba Fett. And despite the fact that that is not my favorite Disney Plus show, okay, we brought Boba Fett back. Like we do, you know, Dave Filoni famously said Darth Maul was so angry that he force held his insides in until he could get to the garbage <laughs> dump. Like, so we, you know, like we start, part of Star Wars <laughs> is, yeah. and, and, and you can even just take the entirety of Clone Wars and say Clone Wars, the animated series went through and dulled down the roughest edges of the prequels mm. and said, hey, I, I know this because I've talked to people that ran the show. Uh, they're like, we think the prequels are really good, but we do get that there's some stuff that got lost in the translation. Let's bring out the best of it in the Clone Wars. And they did. So, you know, I do think that unlike other brands, there does seem to be this, we swing for the fences some of it's great, some of it's not, some of it gets wasted, Captain Phasma. Yeah. And then we're gonna go later on and we're gonna write some comics and we're gonna write some novels and we're gonna do an animated series and we're gonna do a video game and we're gonna do these things and we're gonna make that cool. Like right now, uh, Crimson Dawn is the, one of the cooler things in Star Wars Outlaws. And that's mm. from a movie that most people are like, eh, it's not my favorite Star Wars. So yeah. it's interesting to me that in this Disney Lucas era, we're continuing this tradition almost of taking something that didn't work and taking the, like, I, I understand. I know you guys talked about this last week. Mm. We're obviously not getting an Acolyte season two. Right. It's clear. Star Wars being Star Wars we are absolutely picking up the best threads of Acolyte. Yeah. And those are going to continue on in a okay. Star Wars movie, a Star Wars TV series, or a Star Wars video game in the next five years. Yeah, I agree with you. There's no way they're going to waste a Manny Jacinto performance like that if they, if they, uh, uh, you know, without trying to find a way. Even if they, even if they don't ultimately accomplish it, they're going to try to find a way to bring him back or bring some of those storylines back. I agree with you. Laura, what more, what can you add here is what we, uh, Mike and I have been talking for like 20 minutes back and forth. What, what, what do you want to say on all this? <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, Mike brought up a really interesting point and in that what Disney has done a lot of is like filled in blanks. Maybe they're mm, not necessarily yeah. always like going back and fixing something. Sometimes they are, but sometimes it's just like, Let's take this like unexplored section of story and let's dive into it a little bit deeper and see like what was going on in that era. I mean, that's why we got we've got Star Wars Rebels and Andor that are kind of overlapping timelines and picking up that story right before A New Hope starts. Um, and I really I like that strategy a lot. One question I have for you, Michael, as we're in phase three of the High Republic and it's probably going to be winding down soon. Do you think that that strategy will continue and that they'll go in and maybe not necessarily fix things, but continue to sort of fill in some of the space in between some of those stories? Or do you think the focus is going to really kind of stick with the Skywalkers and in the era that we're in now, kind of just based on the experience that Lucasfilm has now gone through with the Acolyte? The High Republic is such a, it's hard to say because High Republic is such an anomaly for a big company to do with a massive IP. And by what I mean by that is doing a publishing only campaign, putting the acolyte aside for a minute, but doing a publishing only campaign where you're like, we're gonna release kids books, young adult books and adult novels and comic books. And we're gonna tell this epic sweeping story that takes place a hundred years before any character that you care about. And oh. it's, oh, oh, we lost Laura. We lost Laura. Keep she got, going. she did, she was like, fuck you. I don't wanna talk about it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about our public. Um, oh, there she's back. Okay. So <laughs> question and then fail. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
No, but I think that what's interesting is it's hard to say how successful that was. I think that the fact that there's people like you, people like me, like I look on Twitter, there's enough people that know these characters and really like this era that I think it was successful for them. So I think that they will continue in some way, shape or form to build out other eras. I think they do understand that going back to that Skywalker well, as much as I love you know, I mean, I think people kind of refer to uh, Rebels, Solo, and Rogue One as sort of the hidden trilogy in the Star Wars mm, universe because yeah. it's these three stories that fill in that gap between the original trilogy and the new trilogy. Yeah. Nope, between the prequels and the original trilogy. Um, and I think that uh, it, it, it'll be interesting to see, but I hope they do. Because I think that, like I said, I think where Star Wars is the most successful to me, and I, I include Last Jedi in this. Uh, I even include the Acolyte in this, even though I think the execution on Acolyte left a lot to be desired, is there is this desire to stretch beyond the Skywalker saga. There yeah. is this desire to go, let's really put some stakes in the ground in different parts of this universe and not just keep filling in this 50-year period. And I think for them to continue on... That's what they need to do, but there's also a lot of fans that don't like it when they do that. Yeah, it feels like we're in a transition place, right? Like, like we're seeing the older generation of fans, you know, having their moments, having their anger and whatever, and then we're seeing the newer generation of fans start to push the the franchise in certain directions, want certain things, and certainly moving away from the Skywalkers. And if Laura had a way, never visiting Tatooine again, these are these things that you see from the newer fans that they're like, we've seen those stories. Those stories were great. Dad and grandpa can enjoy the store. I want to move to a new place. I want to explore. I want something that's mine. I want new things that are mine that I can connect to, that I can have nostalgia for in the future, that I can uh, discover for the first time with Star Wars together. And that's what I sense when I listen to some, or when I watch some of the, uh, the, the some of the comments and some of the uh, the videos here that uh, that talk about w what they're looking for with the expansion of Star Wars going forward, and certainly I think, as you said, Michael, and as I reiterated earlier, there's there are there is a desire to do this. There is a desire to expand the scope of Star Wars and expand where it wants to go. Laura, am I off base on that? Do you feel that way? The, am I wrong in mischaracterizing your approach to that? No, I think transition's a really good word for it, and I think that it. I agree that there's a desire to sort of take sto these stories in new directions. Mm. Um, it obviously execution is important and the execution of yeah. backlight didn't necessarily work for everybody, but I think it's, it's that transition is also sort of part of a bigger conversation in the entertainment industry. When we think about mm. uh, who is getting the opportunities to write and direct and create these types of stories. I mean, we had kind of our first millennial, making a star Wars show in Leslie Headland. Mm -hmm. And it's disappointing that it didn't necessarily work for everybody, but eventually that age group like needs to start being brought in to tell some of these stories. You can't yeah. keep relying on the boomers and gen X to keep bringing us star Wars. Eventually it's going to have to evolve and you're going to need to start bringing in some of those younger storytellers. And I think it speaks a lot to what's happening in the industry as a whole and these problems with writer's rooms not being much of a thing anymore and showrunners not really bringing on the next generation and trying to bring them up and train them to be showrunners themselves. Um, that that seems to be an issue right now. And I'm kind of hoping that as maybe that'll get resolved kind of in the next 10 years and there will be more younger storytellers kind of stepping up into some of those showrunner roles in, in, a, in a successful way. Um, but I, I certainly hope that these stories continue to evolve because at the Acolyte tried something new. It tried something fresh and unique. The Last Jedi tried something new and fresh and unique. And you're not going to please every single Star Wars fan. There's not going to be a single story that comes out that everybody is super excited about. Like the Mandalorian was kind of an anomaly, but... Yeah, I I hope that we continue to get some of these fresh and new takes, and that Lucasfilm doesn't necessarily shy away from those younger storytellers or from those unique stories, because that really it's going to have to move in that direction inevitably. And and I what I worry about, I just mm. call it the rise of Skywalker syndrome, because particularly mm. look, J.J. Abrams makes a beautiful movie, and I will give Rise of Skywalker credit that there are a couple sequences and there's some aliens in there that I'm like, this looks great. 
Yeah. Like this looks good, but Rise of Skywalker just feels like Disney and Lucasfilm going, oh, they got mad. Hurry, back it up, back yeah, it up, yeah, back yeah. it up. Give them what they want. Give them what they want. And I and I I, I worry that that's the road they're going to go down. And I think you're right. I think that. Uh, but I do think the question we bring this up on Geek Buddies all the time, mm. and I think it's a good question to bring up to you guys. Like, what is next for Star? Like, we know Skeleton Crew's coming, and we know that there's mm. supposed to be this Ray movie and a story about the origins of the Jedi, and then the wrap up of Filoni's thing, but. Aside from the wrap up of Filoni's thing, which is still taking place within the guardrails of the universe and the timeline that we all know, yeah. the Ray movie is out here. Go, it's past the Empire. It's past the First Order, and I think what they're wrestling with, and what fans are going to have to wrestle with, is what is Star Wars with no Skywalkers, no First Order, no Empire, no Palpatine returned somehow, like what what is that and i you know i think that's what they really need to answer yeah i think that's going to be the question going forward because for all the crap that kathleen takes if you really honestly pull back and look at these last 10 years there are an incredible amount of chances that were taken by star wars to try to do something new and as laura point out the new kind of uh, approach to it or s some bold decisions and i know people might scoff at that but i think it's pretty bold let's bring in a mandalorian and a baby yoda and let's see if this works let's bring let's do a story about a rebel where there's no lightsabers that are drawn at all and we're just going to keep it really ground-based and tell this story about a rebellion let's explore the last jedi let's give leia force powers these are all whether you like them or not you you, you objectively they're bold choices and so Kathleen has shown a propensity to take chances with the franchise. And occasionally, yes, Michael, we get something like Rise of Skywalker, which is listening to the fans and trying to appease them. Maybe, as as has been rumored, Filoni going in and messing with a little bit of the acolyte because they don't want it to be too, uh, too uh, aggressive or abrasive in its approach and what have you. But I don't know. But either way, you look at all of it, and there have been chances taken. I mean, starting a High Republic – from scratch, in essence, using all of that and, and building it out, that's a bold decision. And so there've been a lot of there's been a lot of bold decisions made under Kathleen Kennedy's reign, whether you love or a hater. I don't think you can deny that. And so now you guys, well, what, from what a lot of people are hearing and certainly people are talking about, I think with a bit more actual credibility is this: there's a real possibility that after this Mando and Grogu movie comes out, she steps down. And so you're like, well, if she steps down, fine. You can all celebrate, do your little Ewok dance around or whatever you want to do. But if the person who comes in next is all about just satisfying one section of the angry fandom, you're going to alienate a lot of people. And so where is the boldness going to come from? Where is the thing that really marks Star Wars, which is its a desire to take chances with its content, with its franchise, with its characters, with its worlds? Where is that going to come from with a new person coming in? Because right now, I don't see anybody sitting on the periphery, aside from maybe Favreau, who probably wouldn't want to do it, who could step in and actually take charge of this whole thing and, and steer it as Kathleen Kennedy did over these last 10 years. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Laura? I mean, it's going to come from the books. If you if you if you mm. really want to put it down as, you know, somebody new is going to come in and they're going to be gun shy, at least at first, inevitably, in taking chances, I think the books kind of get to sort of stand alone on their own. You've got different people kind of running the show at these different publishing houses. And I think that that's where they're willing to take a little bit more risks or yeah. at least like then sometimes pick up some of these story threads. I mean, one of you mentioned Phasma. I haven't thought about that book yeah, in so long or that character in so long. That book was so good by Delilah yeah. Dawson. If you haven't read the Phasma book and you <clears> want to get into Star Wars reading, that's a really good one. Um, to start with, because it has its own sequel. The Galaxy's Edge Black Spire book is kind of a sequel to Phasma. Also very good. Um, everybody thought that book was going to be like an advertisement for the theme park. It's not. It's actually a really good novel. Um, but yeah, that that would be my guess, is that no matter who comes in next to kind of take over for Kathleen Kennedy, is if, if there's any plan for her to retire anytime soon, um, I think that whoever that is, is going to be a little bit gun shy and going to want to pull it back kind of like we're, we're hearing now we're hearing now that like there's rumors that there's just going to be one show per year or one star wars project per year i kind of have a hard time believing that at least for like the next couple of years because there's so much stuff that feels like it's kind of 
like coming up on us pretty quickly that have been mm -hmm. in development for a while. But I wouldn't be surprised if some whoever comes up and takes that job is a little bit on the Shire side for a while. And maybe we go for a period of time where the most bold stories are coming out of Star Wars publishing, but be it comics or novels, young adult novels, adult novels. Um, that would be my guess. But yeah. where that leads, I don't know. I mean, does that mean that they're going to start maybe then taking some of the books and adapting those to the screen? I don't know. I kind of don't want that to be the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if they sort of fall back on something like that at some yeah. point. Michael, there are almost 50 adult novels that were released under this 10-year canon timeline, right? And there's like a little bit over 20 of young adult novels and even more junior novels. And so there's a lot to choose from when if you're going to start exploring ways to expand the brand from the novels. Is Laura off base here? Do you think Laura is actually walking the path that you think they're going to walk here in the future? It, they might do that. Um, mm. You know, I, I've said for years that I think that at some point, and, you know, they're doing this in The Mandalorian, they're doing this in uh, in the it, with, with the Ahsoka series. Like, there's definitely an element of let's connect the dots from mm. Return of the Jedi to Force Awakens and make the whole somehow Palpatine returned, smooth it out the way Clone Wars smoothed out a lot of the prequels. So I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up getting some animated series that falls within that time period or an animated series that fills in the gaps between last Jedi and rise of Skywalker. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's definitely some things like that they could do, but I think, I, I think what star Wars needs to do more because like most of the books take the high Republic as its own thing. Yeah. Most of the books are just filling in the gaps of things that happen in the movies. There's a really great young Leia book. There's the Ahsoka hmm. book. There's a Padme book. You know, there's all these books that sort of take elements of these characters. Like let's tell this story about how they got from here to here to here. And I think the big question they wrestle with is, but what can we tell beyond that? And I think hmm. that is the, that is the line where everybody freaks out. And you know, like the, it's interesting because of all the big brands that are out there, um, you know, DC and Marvel don't have this problem. DC and Marvel have 60 years of stories and 60 years worth of characters, and they mm. can go to the well and they can pick the characters and say, we're adapting this and we're doing our version of it. And then they'll do it for a couple of years and it won't work. And they'll be like, okay, we brought in somebody else. We're going to do a new Batman. We're doing a new Superman. We're going to reboot the Marvel universe. So they just mm. keep kind of going back to those same characters. Star Trek is the closest thing that Star Wars has, but Star Trek, the Federation is the through line. Yeah. So, you know, like, like Star, Star Trek, they won it back in the day when Next Generation came out and an entire fan base said, oh, cool. The Enterprise and the Federation works for me. I don't need Kirk. I don't need Sulu. I don't mm -hmm. like, like they avoided the Star Wars problem of going, I guess we just have to keep telling stories about this specific cast and this crew of the Enterprise. So in the world of Star Trek, we're used to. We went from Next Generation to Deep Space Nine to Voyager, and we did all of this stuff. And now we sort of live in different eras of Star Trek. We go, oh, yeah. this is like the Kirk era. This is during the Next Generation era. Oh, this is way off in the future in Discovery where the new Federation show is going to take place. So we sort of are comfortable with brand new casts existing in this universe. Star Wars has such a specific story that George Lucas told with such specific mythic elements that getting out of that it just you know a nobody really knows mm. if they're making the right call or not and everyone's afraid to fuck up the star wars universe and then as we've been saying anytime you get away from some of those mythic elements there's a there's a section of the fan base that goes oh this doesn't feel legit to me yeah this is no good this is no good so it's it's a it's a it's a real catch-22 like how to get out of it and still have something come out and go yep this feels legit yeah, I mean, you look at something like Dark Disciples, a fantastic novel, or the Alphabet Squadron series. Like, there are things to explore. The Thrawn book, the Ascendancy, all of that. There is stuff to explore if they wanted to open the door to the books. But you're right, Mike. How much are the fandom, how much is the fandom going to be patient as they try these things out, as they explore these things? Huh? There is a certain section that is invested in it failing so they can keep doing what they're doing. But a majority of the fandom wants to see it succeed and wants to enjoy Star Wars again and wants to see its best uh, foot being put forward. And this is where I think the issue lies, is that the franchise has become so big that they are a victim of their own success. And in that, you have to come correct 
with almost every project because people's expectations are so high because you've given them great stuff over the years. And by the way, Michael, you make an excellent point. George Lucas is essentially the TVA because there is one timeline and no one fucks with that timeline. In Star Trek, you've got the Kelvin timeline and the other time. So even within Star Trek, they've split timelines. Yeah. This is very clearly a TVA main timeline and no one ever messes it or creates an alternate timeline that is accepted within the canon universe. And so they have to adhere to all of that. So how do you adhere to it yet take the chances? Well, you've got to take the chances and you've got to find the right creators and you've got to have that right combination because it's very difficult to have a successful series, a successful movie, a successful animated series. It's very difficult. A lot of factors have to come into play. And unfortunately now, because Star Wars has become so big, which is what they wanted, they are a victim of their own success because if they don't hit it out of the box, uh, people are going to absolutely come after them. And this is now what they're going to have to navigate in this new world whether Kathleen Kennedy stays on or not, it's a new world they're going to have to now explore even more so. And going back to the rise of the Jedi is fun and all, but that's still just kind of co copping out yeah. by going back to something that people know, right? Well, like, I would ask, I mean, Laura, it's a question for you because mm -hmm. I know you're such a big fan of the High Republic. Um, as like a newer star, not newer in like the new era of Star Wars fan, um, yeah. what is it about High Republic that feels Star Wars to you? Good question, yeah. That, I mean, that is a good question. And it's, it's kind of one of those things where when I went into the Acolyte, I was kind of hoping that knowing that it was the High Republic, I would just kind of recognize that without being able to like voice exactly what it was. I'm like, oh, this would like feel like the High Republic. And I still don't know what exactly it is about the Acolyte that didn't work for me as a gigantic High Republic fan. Right. Hmm. Um, and I, I think that part of it was just kind of this fresh new place that I could come in and kind of be on the ground floor when it started, because no matter what, I'll never know every single, even after doing the showdown, I'll never know every <laughs> single thing. I'll never have been there in 1977 when a right. new hope came out right. in never have been through that experience. And I think for me, that was the higher public in, in light of the Jedi, that first book was, it was my A New Hope in 1977. I got to get in on the, the ground floor and really be submerged in this new lore of what feels like a new universe, but also feels very familiar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe the best way I can put it. It's really hard to kind of describe what it is I, I love about it so much. But so much of Star Wars for me is character driven. Mm -hmm. Like if I can't connect with a character in a book or on screen, I'm not going to get on board. I mean, Kanan and Hera were those characters that I just latched onto so quickly in Star Wars Rebels. Um, and to have Avar Chris and Elzar Man kind of be at like the forefront of Light of the Jedi and getting them as kind of the through line through a lot yeah. of the adult novel novels in the High Republic, I think that's kind of where I've been able to connect. It, it always is going to be character driven for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that that's a that's a good question. One of these days, maybe I'll be able to put words it's, to it that are a little more elegant. So one of the things oh. that I learned that has really been useful in a lot of the meetings and a lot of the jobs I get hired for now, but one of the things I learned when I worked at Hasbro, oddly, was uh, you know, how to like building brand DNA, like like mm. really understanding like toy companies, like they've got brand like transform like obviously Hasbro's My Little Pony, GI Joe, Transformers. They have these big brands that from the '80s to today they're still doing stuff with, and they build these DNA pyramids. They build these brand DNA pyramids, and they call them a pyramid because at the bottom of the pyramid you throw everything you can think of under the sun. Okay, uh, rebels, uh, lightsabers, the Force. Aliens, scum and villainy, cantinas, dirty, old, like you do anything you can and you can build it and build it and build it until you get to the tippy top of the of the brand DNA. And that's kind of like the 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 one thing that you're like, this is what makes the brand work. And so for My Little Pony, while I was there, it was obviously friendship is magic. Uh, for Transformers, it is more than meets the eye. And like the thing about Star Wars is the thing that makes it work, and you can tell because they use this word, if you were going to make a word chart in Star Wars, they use it more than any other word, is hope. hope. I mean, it's hope. literally in the title, A yeah. New Hope. But like you get to the end of Rogue One, what does Princess Leia say? Hope. Like the number of times hope comes up in the High Republic uh, the Jedi are a, a, a beacon and the starlight beacon is a beacon of hope in the darkness. Like hope is this constant thread. Um, 
and what and the Jedi representing that. And it's interesting to me because through the course of the timeline that we know from the High Republic to Rey saying to an old lady in the desert that she's Rey Skywalker, um, like the Jedi Order and the Jedi Order representing hope, but then the Jedi Order falling and the Jedi Order losing hope and the Jedi Order try and Luke Skywalker trying having the hope to start a new Jedi Order, but then Jedi but then Luke Skywalker losing his hope when the Ben Solo thing happened. Like and then um Last Jedi is all about that. Like it's the spark, we are the spark of rebellion. We are the spark of hope in the darkness. Like so it's like that's a thing that I think one of the reasons the High Republic works is because they understand that and they like double down on hope. So when you start, to me, when you start to build whatever is gonna come next for Star Wars, you, the hardest thing to do is you have to ignore all the fans. <laughs> I know like half of you I, are you're like, fuck you that I just said that. Cause I know it's like, we should listen to the fans. We should do this. But to really figure out that next chapter, you have to like get all the noise out and you have to go, okay, hope is important i want to talk about the jedi order i need a scummy cantina i need a bounty hunter i need a kind of roguish guy who's selling spice on the side like you start to build out the things that feel star wars and that's kind of what they need to do they just have to go to a big whiteboard and just whiteboard it from here and i don't know that they quite have the courage to do that yet or the creators yet to do that so that's going to be interesting you know jeff snyder said on the hot mic or said in his newsletter rather uh, that uh, from what he his sources tell him at Lucasfilm, they're apparently developing a number of projects right now, a number of TV shows developing the, the, the stuff that hasn't even been hinted at or talked about anywhere. So clearly they're still working on stuff. Clearly they have an idea of that they want to go forward with some, some shows here. And what are those shows going to be? I guess we'll find out in the future. So clearly they're still constantly working regardless of all the anger and toxicity sometimes and the frustration and all the positive stuff. They're still very much trying to keep at it and trying to figure out and what the shows are that people want to watch and what's the, what are the ones that are going to break through like Mandalorian, like Andor and what have you going forward. So it's going to be interesting to see. Um, let me swing back to Laura. Here's we're running out of time. Laura, your thoughts on the new Republic, the Canon rather, your thoughts on the new the new characters we got uh, introduced here in the over these last 10 years what are some of the uh, your favorite characters that maybe we wouldn't have gotten to see in a different era of star wars or different iteration of star wars under different leadership what are some of the interesting and in, uh, characters that you fall in love with over these last 10 years I mean, Ahsoka Tano stands out as a major one. I mean, that you guys I think hit the nail on the head where you were talking about how they created the clone wars to kind of Mm. brush down some of those like rough edges of the prequels um so going into that story like that was the strategy but like look what came out of it was that this character that connected so profoundly with so many people and has gone on to jump to live action jump to other animated projects jump to novels and comics i mean it's that's one of them that really stands out. I Ahsoka will always have this warm place in my heart just because mm. not even because she was like one of the first ones I fell in love with. Like that was Rebels. But when they introduced her in that season finale of season one, I was just like, oh, this is this is important. This is something that I need to actually go back and do my research. And that's what got me to actually go back and watch all of the Clone Wars finally. Mm. Um, so that that's a big one. But yeah, the High Republic characters that are out there, I mean, Michael, you're talking about hope, and I think about that first chapter, the end of the first chapter of Live the Jedi, where it ends with Avar Chris, you know, this is Jedi Master Avar Chris, help is on the way. After that horrific, like, tragedy that yeah. happens in the very, like, right off of the bat. Um, I think that's another big important thing in Star Wars is the stakes. They have to, in this in these stories, you have to have all of these elements, but you also have to establish, like, what the stakes are so quickly just to draw people in. And I think the High Republic did a really good job of that. So a lot of those characters that I really love, besides Kanan, Hera, Ahsoka, Avar, and Elzar in the High Republic, I mean, that that's, I think, a big important story element, too. Mm, yeah. Michael, your thoughts? Characters? Yeah, I uh, 100% on Ahsoka Tano. Yeah. I mean, Ahsoka Tano, I think, is one of the greatest things that has happened to Star Wars ever and uh, is largely in the new era. I mean, she did start in the pre-Disney era. Right. But I mean, some of her best moments of her story came uh, came after that. 
So her, I think Grogu. Yeah. Listen, man. Yeah. We. How old was Yoda when he died? Nine hundred. Yeah, something like that. Grogu is fifty. <laughs> And They're he is not a Molly. Sh- he's not a Molly Shannon fifty. He is a young fifty, <laughs> and he can kick and yes. he can jump, uh, and and he can do it all. Like Grogu, could could carry the Star Wars. You ten years from now, give us a movie with like a teenage Grogu who's oh. like two hundred and fifty to three hundred years old, and he's a little badass fucking bounty hunter Mandalorian Jedi. Everyone who grew up with Grogu is going to be like my fuck my 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 dreams have come true. So Grogu and Ahsoka, I think, are two of the best. I I actually really like Rey. Yeah. I think that Rey got done dirty a couple times. Like I don't think her story is the smoothest in those three movies. But I genuinely think Daisy Ridley did a great job, and I am a hundred percent on board to see Rey's story continue with some storytellers that actually have more of a plan. Hmm. Similarly. Uh, I think Finn is one of the most wasted potential characters in the modern Star Wars universe. Yeah, yeah. I think a character that was a stormtrooper that walked away from being a stormtrooper that now is uh, also force sensitive and his bestie is the new head of the Jedi Order and he wants to learn to be a Jedi. Like it's like there is so much to Finn that is just gold and John Boyega is such an amazing actor and I think Finn really got done dirty. Like, like they just veered to Kylo and Ray, the whole Raylo thing, and Finn just got done dirty. So I think <laughs> Finn has a massive, massive amount of potential. Um, I think those are the big ones. I mean, I could go through and talk about my love for all the characters, and I could dive into the High Republic forever. But wow. when I think of like, if I'm sitting in the Kathleen Kennedy chair, and I'm like, what are the things that I really think are important that we do? Um, like that, like, I don't, I I don't know. And I, a lot of this is dependent on John Boyega who said he would never come back, but I don't know how you tell a story about Ray building a new Jedi order without Finn right by her side. Exactly. Who, who, who who basically, even though he didn't say it in rise of Skywalker was force sensitive. Like, so like, I think like that is like a definite to me. I think that I don't know where Grogu was during the new trilogy, Mm. but I don't know how Ray builds a new Jedi order and you don't have Grogu there. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, there's these pieces of the, pu- and Ahsoka, I don't really know how long to grew to live, but you know, she could still be <laughs> around too. Like I, so I just think that like, when I'm looking at what's moving forward, those are some of the key characters that I'm like, guys, the future of star Wars is here. This is where it is. Yeah. I, I echo your love of Ray. That is one that I've defended. I take her over Kylo any day of the week and twice on Sundays. I love what Daisy Ridley did with that character. So I echo your love. I echo uh, Ahsoka Tano as well. And as Michael, as you correctly pointed out, a lot of some of the big events uh, happening uh, when um, Disney took over the franchise for sure. But I mean, I'll throw a few more in here. Fennec Shand, what a fantastic character she has been to come out and have a really strong uh, uh, life here during the Disney uh, time during those 10 years. I really enjoy that. People love Babu Frick. Certainly that's been fun to see. You love me some Babu Frick. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> Grogu, absolutely. I think I think if there is no Baby Yoda, there is no way Star Wars is is, is as successful now as it as it uh, as it uh, as it could have as it might not have been. It might not have been as successful now uh, if uh, if Grogu wasn't so popular. And I mean, if it hadn't come along and been so big with Din Djarin as well, who I think is another one of the fantastic characters to be a part of this as well. If you look at Andor, Kino Loy, Kino Loy was great in that. What an introduction there with Andy Serkis and that character. And Luthan Rael, what Stellan Skarsgård was able to bring to that character within uh, the old... Uh, and then Moff Gideon, throw in Moff Gideon. I thought Giancarlo Esposito has been fantastic as Moff Gideon. That's another character. K2SO from Rogue One. How fun has that droid been with Alan Tudyk? voice and cat and of course cassian and cassian's mom fiona shaw that speech from fiona shaw is arguably the greatest speech of the last 10 years in disney star wars uh that sparks the fight there in the streets uh in in uh, in andor so to me there have been a lot of, and Cobb vanth has been a fun character right to roll up in here uh with the performances there it might yeah well i was gonna say i mean i think you know you brought up k2so and i think you also got to give star wars a lot of credit for even in the movies and tv shows that aren't my favorite yeah. um chopper droids chopper. droids yeah like chopper chopper is an a plus droid right uh k2so as you brought up a plus droid bb8 is amazing BB-8. 
Like yeah. BB-8's performance in The Force Awakens is one of the best performances in that movie. I think he, by the end of the movie, gets a little bit wasted. By the end of the trilogy, gets a little wasted too. But even L-337, uh, yeah. Waller-Bridge and Solo, I think 100%. is an amazing droid who ultimately, you know, becomes the Millennium Falcon. Um, but I think that like there's there's a lot of, yeah, the part's a little weird. But, uh, but I think that, yeah. um, you know, like the, the, the tradition of these amazing droid characters in the universe uh, are also like there's 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 pieces of everything like i don't think that there's a single star war mm. that's come out animated tv or movie where i couldn't go to it and say okay i like this yeah i like this part i like this planet i like this scene i like i'll take this and pull it out and put it in another story and make it better there's a lot that i don't think works there's a lot that i think is disappointing yeah but i think that everything there's something in there that i'm like yeah this is pretty good I mean, Balin Skull, Jin Urso, I think those are ones. I mean, Balin most recently, even with it, even, I think even even though Soul was, uh, you know, kind of done dirty in the Acolyte, I thought that was a fantastic performance. Well, Soul's a great thing, character. Right? Omega in Clone Force 99. I would argue that that was a nice Omega. addition. Omega. Yeah, exactly. Omega. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a nice addition. So, I mean, I think there's been, for you know, and again, factoring already the, the anger, the frustration, there have been some pitfalls. Not strong stuff. When you look overall, the last 10 years, there's been a lot to enjoy within the Star Wars universe. And yes, as Laura pointed out, maybe the last five years, a bit more hit or miss, but there's still stuff to enjoy. So if you're looking at it objectively, I think you can say there's potential, as Michael said, Star Wars is here. The future is already here. There's potential for some fantastic storytelling if you get the right people in place to do it and understand how to work these characters and use the storylines that will excite people and expand the universe while also still honoring what came before. Michael, you I mean, look, I'm excited for Skeleton Crew. Yeah. I'm excited for Skeleton Crew. I'm I you you had me at <laughs> doing uh doing Goonies in space, doing an Amblin movie in space. But I think look, I, I say this all the time. Like, like I if you are a Star Wars fan of a certain age and you watch the original trilogy and then your life went on and there was no other Star Wars, and then you just had some comic books and some shitty novels. Some good novels, hey, some shitty oh, novels. No, oh. some were good. Not those paperbacks off the rack in 7-Eleven. How dare you? How dare you? I'm going to tell you right now. Star Wars, Star Wars readers of this era don't know how well they oh. are eating compared to like what we had in the yeah. past. Like, like, I've been a fan through the dry periods. <laughs> yeah. Ditto. Like I've been a fan when there was nothing really to be a fan of. Um, and so now that we get stuff and look, I think Boba Fett is bad. I, I was disappointed by a lot of live action Ahsoka. Uh, I wish the acolyte had, had execution that was half as good as it's, uh, as, as what it wanted to tell. Mm. But man, I think it's still a good time to be a star Wars fan. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, last words here it's, as we wrap up our episode uh, talking about the last 10 years here of the Disney canon. You know, I don't know if I have much more to add to that. I think that that's right. And I it does put it into perspective. Like I go a month without getting a new book or a new comic and I'm like, oh, this is the, <laughs> it's going to be quiet. It's, there's not going to be anything to talk about. Like this is a dry period. We'll just got to wait till see. Yeah, no, I don't. I truly have no idea how good I have it. I fully respect that. Um, <laughs> you're right, though. It is a good time to be a Star Wars fan. I'll give you that. And I think that's a great way to end it. Absolutely. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us and watching or listening to us on the Jedi way. We appreciate it madly. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with us. We appreciate it. Please let people know where they can find you and your uh, 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 um, viral tweets that you've been having lately and some of these back and forth conversations that you've gotten into in your life. Have I had viral tweets? I hey, had one just a few days ago, a few thousand. That's a viral tweet. Did I? Yes. Don't oh, act shit. You. Don't act Do you mute it after 52? <laughs> That's yeah. And then I, you have, to have somebody tell you. I, yeah. I just throw <laughs> thoughts out there and then don't really pay attention. Um, you well, you can clearly find me and my viral tweets on Twitter at MKTune. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram at MKTune. Um, you can also find me every week right on the Outlaw Nation page with Mr. John Roca and Mr. Shannon McClung as we talk all things geek on Geek Buddies. And uh, you can see some of my work on Netflix with uh, Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City, uh, seasons one and two of the shorts and uh, four animated movies. And uh, hopefully you'll see more from me coming very, very soon.
Uh, there you go. All right, Laura Kelly, another fun show with you. Uh, please let people know what you got going on and uh, when the new episode of Force Toast Pod is coming. Yeah, come find me on Twitter at shutup underscore Laura. My handle is right down there. My podcast, Force Toast to Star Wars Happy Hour. That's the handle for on Twitter and Instagram there at Force Toast Pod. Uh, we'll have a new episode coming out on Tuesday this nice. coming week. Um, it's been about a month, so we have a lot to catch up on news wise. I think we're going to talk about High Republic comics. There was like a High Republic Adventures comic series called Saber for Hire. I think we need to recap that still. So that's on the list. Um, among other High Republic stories, I can imagine. So come find us at Force Toast Pod on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find me at Shut Up underscore Laura on Twitter and Instagram. As for me, it's at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. As Michael said, uh, we do the Geek Buddies every week, uh, sometimes multiple times a week. Go and listen to the rest of the stuff or watch the rest of the stuff here on the channel and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell button so you see we're dropping all the content we do here uh on the outlaw nation channel thank you so much for hanging out with us on the jedi way and laura what do we have to tell them always remember your focus determines your reality